Welcome to episode 39 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm joined by Josh Fields of the Libertarian Apothecary, and this episode is reviewing White Fragility, this book here. This episode is part three of my series on race-related matters. Now, don't worry if you didn't listen to the last one. Each episode is independent of the other. However, to get the fullest context, I definitely recommend watching them all. In episode 37, we discuss the uh, experience of being experienced. For those who might prefer a monologue style episode, check out episode 36, where it's just me and I discuss the same topic. This week, as I said, we're reviewing Robin D'Angelo's book, as you can see here, White Fragility. So let's dive right in. How's it going, Josh? It's going pretty well, Dio. How are you doing today, buddy? Very well. I cannot complain too terribly much. I believe the weather outside <laughs> is doing us pretty well here in uh, Jacksonville, uh, Florida. Yeah, we can't complain here in Florida, buddy. There's a lot of the country that's suffering right now. Right. So the first question that people might have is, why would you read this book, White Fragility? When you start talking about race-related matters, there are a lot of strong opinions. So I decided that there, I've got to have some reasoning, some rationale behind it. And I came up with three reasons why I believe that it's not a bad idea to read the book and you know do a, uh, do a bit of a book report. We call this a book report for adults. Yeah. And so here are those three reasons. One, we should all be engaged in the conversation on race. Whether you like it or not, agree or disagree, it is a major topic in America. And regardless of your specific position, the one thing that most people happen to have in common is that they believe where we are in this conversation on race-related matters is not where we need to be. The second reason is in 1980, Isaac Asimov wrote an article titled the cult, uh, A Cult of Ignorance. He's criticizing this idea of America's right to know that's being used to support the freedom of the press. And he, his grounds for this is that America has this tendency to either not be able to read, not be willing to read, or thinking that educating yourself is something for the elite. And he's disputing that. And he goes on to say this, I believe, I'm quoting here, I believe that every human being with a physically normal brain can learn a great deal and be surprisingly intellectual. I believe that we badly need social approval of learning and social rewards for learning. We can all be members of the intellectual elite. And only then a phrase like America's right to know, uh, America's right to know, and indeed any true concept of democracy um, can have any meaning, end quote. In other words, being intellectual is for everyone. And then finally, my third reason, if you happen to have caught episode number 32 back when I was doing audio only, I quoted John Stuart Mill from his book on liberty. The quote's a bit long, so I'm just going to go ahead and summarize what he had to say. But he's tell he tells us that if you cannot refute the other side's view, or worse, you don't know it, then you don't belong having an opinion on it. And that if you do have one, it's going to likely be based on some authority or whatever simply just feels best. He then goes on to tell us that uh, that the uh, it, that the best way to understand somebody's argument is to hear it from somebody who's going to earnestly give you this, their argument. In other words, it's not, it's not as good as hearing it from somebody that you particularly like who's refuting it, but it's better to hear it from somebody who's trying to actually convince you because then and only then will you get the fullest and best perception of that particular idea. And then when, once you have that, then you have done full justice. And if you remember, I called it being an earnest adversary back in episode 32. You know, an mm -hmm. earnest adversary says, I'm going to take your argument and I'm going to hear it from you with the fullness of the, your ability to persuade me. And then I will, look, uh, I will see if I agree or disagree. So that is the idea behind you know, studying, you know, reading this book. And I read it, I read it, I said three, I read it twice 
twice because uh, there was a lot in there, and it was it was actually, I actually spent a lot of time, a great deal of time, trying to figure out. Okay, you know, I knew there were a lot of things that I disagreed with, and it was like, all right, I can't just go line by line with the disagreement. So, so how do we narrow it down? Josh, what do you say to all that? Um, well, for, for starters, I, I think it's at the beginning of this because I'm going to be pretty harsh on on this book and on the topic. I, I want to underscore your three points. Um, you said, uh, first, uh, most people are not going to think that race relations and the race conversation is where it needs to be. I think that's a really fair statement. So I think most people, regardless of background, uh, they're going to agree that we're, we're not where we want to be collectively. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point you, you said uh, with Asimov talking about that, someone with a normal, healthy human being, uh, regardless of background, could be an intellectual as long as they right. have normal cognition. I, I completely agree with that. Now, the whole social rewards and, uh, you know, I don't know about all that, but, sure, um, sure. you know, knowledge truly is a, uh, a powerful thing and sh should never be something that's kept to, uh, th that's been used, knowledge throughout all history has been used as a dividing point uh, between mm -hmm. classes of people. Right. Um, so, you know, and our founders uh, talked about, even though they, they weren't ever, uh, nobody had ever called them socialist. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly did believe that um, education should be something that should be a priority. Right. Uh, now, uh, the problem is we, we delineate that further is what exactly is education? What exactly is knowledge? Uh, right. You know, those can be a whole topics of themselves. Uh, your, your third point, um, it, it is very important to understand uh, where someone is coming from. It, it is, it is, so you, if you're wanting to understand a subject, uh, as you, you paraphrased, it's important to get someone who is going to profess that subject uh, honestly and earnestly. Mm -hmm. um, then you can understand, then if you look at it from their point of view, uh, then you can, one, either understand your conviction better, uh, you know, because you see flaws in the other argument, or right. two, perhaps maybe it changes your paradigm a little bit or right. completely or completely. I mean, uh, I've, I've had experiences in my life where I've come across the piece of literature that I was apprehensive about and mm -hmm. I read it and then, you know, you finish it and you're like, oh, <laughs> what, what just happened? You know, right. I, I, right. I got to read I got to read this again. Yeah. So if you if you go into reading anything with a closed mind, mm -hmm. uh, you might as well not be reading. Right. Uh, now, there is something else also. What's that old saying? Uh, don't uh, don't have such an open mind that your brain falls out. Oh, I've not heard that one, but it makes sense. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, if you're not careful when you're reading some books, your brain will fall out. Uh, gotcha. You know, and that's just being intellectually honest. Uh, but still try to when you look at something, always go for the merit first. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I try to say. So uh, I, I'm excited about breaking this book down. Um, Gotcha. So in the spirit of making sure that we hear from Robin D'Angelo herself, um, because I know that many people watching this may not have read the book. And so, you know, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm being very, uh, uh, I am giving a proper reading of what she has to say. I found an interview in The Guardian where she briefly describes what right for white fragility is. Let's go ahead and take a quick listen. White fragility is the defensiveness, the argumentation, the hurt feelings, the withdrawal that often erupts whenever white people are challenged on their racial worldviews. The fragility part is meant to capture how little it takes to cause white people to erupt in defensiveness. But the impact of that defensiveness, however, is not fragile at all. It functions as a kind of everyday white racial control by making it so difficult for people to challenge us uh, on our unaware assumptions and biases that most of the time they don't. And so it, it functions to keep everybody in their place and protect the racial hierarchy. Okay, so now that you've heard Robin D'Angelo herself describing what fr white fragility is. I'm going to operate that I'm going to operate um, on the uh, on the notion that white fragility is the negative or untoward response from white people when challenged on their racial worldview. And D'Angelo then elaborates on the impact, telling us that these responses they may seem minor, but they have a major impact, and they make having a conversation difficult. In a sense. 
I agree. But it's quite a bit, but there's quite a bit to disagree with, uh, with, dis with uh, Dr. D'Angelo when you read the book and further her paper of the same title. So I have three key points of disagreement with white fragility as described with, uh, by Dr. D'Angelo. The first one is that I believe it's overly complex. The second one is that it's disingenuous. And then it contributes to the cult of ignorance as we described uh, a moment ago from Asimov in his 1980 paper. Josh, tell me your first thoughts on, on that video clip in, in white fragility and what she has to say about it before we dive into these three areas. Um, well, she uses um, truth. Now, I, I always like to say any good lie inc it, you know, includes a shred of truth. It uses that right. as its pillar. If you, if you approach anybody on any subject, regardless of what we're talking about, and you make a claim, mm -hmm. uh, say, I, I say to you, hey, hey Liberty Dad, um, you know, I don't know, uh, the sky's green. Okay, well, right. it, it does. You could say, oh, well, no, it's 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 not green, or right. you get defensive about it. You know, the fact that you would protest my my assertion because that's what it is. She she doesn't present with the question of does white fragility exist. Right. She begins with the assertion that it is a, a it's a posit. It's this is this is established truth. Right. And your act of defense or defiance against this said truth mm -hmm. is an indicator of your guilt. Right. Um, so right off the bat, that puts me at a situation where I'm like, okay, as being a clinician, uh, being a pharmacist, apothecary, I approach everything objectively. So if you start out with a, a theory or a scientific postulation that in and itself is embedded a, a statement that your challenge to this is your admission of the correctness of this statement. Right. Uh, you know, that automatically shoots up red flags to me, no matter what gotcha. the subject we're talking about. Gotcha. So yeah. in addition, so, so just so we're clear here, you're talking about the infamous Kafka trap, which comes from yeah. the, the, uh, the book. Um, it's by Franz Kafka, I believe. And I'm trying to mm -hmm. remember the title at the moment. I'm drawing a blank. Uh, oh goodness juror no it's um i don't remember the title but hey uh Fran you can look it up franz kafka uh, franz kafka wrote a book and i guess that i believe a guy is on trial i think it's called the trial uh and a, and a guy is on trial and everything uh, yeah, that yeah, he I think says, right, yeah. yep, everything he says is being used as evidence of his guilt so he's like well i didn't do that and it's like aha that's exactly what a guilty person would say and yeah. there is a lot of that in this book there's a lot of okay, this is exactly what we would expect somebody who is fragile to say. So therefore, anything you say effectively is, uh, is evidence that A, white fragility exists, and then B, that you have it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I think is interesting about this is that um, I feel like it's overly complex because it's what I like to call scope creep. And so in the clip that we just saw, it seems like a very simple concept. You know, hey, white people have some attitudes and behaviors that make challenging their racial worldviews, whether they're right or wrong, more difficult. Uh, but when you start digging in, you realize that there really is scope creep. And just in case anybody's not familiar with the term, scope creep is, and uh, I, I used to work as in process management. And it's basically when a project increases its scope in size, and then it takes a lot longer and more resources to accomplish. So a good example of that would be like, if I go out to the garage and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna organize my toolboxes. And then while I'm there, I decide to organize my workbench. And mm -hmm. then I decide to entire, you know, the entire work, uh, the garage. That's how, that's how all and, garage projects right, go. <laughs> right, and then I decide, you know, while I'm here, I might as well just clean the car, I've been meaning to do that anyway. Well, that's scope creep. And then it's like, well, what happened today? Well, it took me like five hours to clean the garage. Well, no, it took me five hours to do a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And so in the introduction, and I'm, I'm going to do some quoting here. Um, here's what D'Angelo says in, in the introduction of her book. She says, I began to see what I think of as pillars of whiteness, the unexamined beliefs that prop up our racial responses. It doesn't sound like much, but then if you go to her 2011 paper, and this is this paper is where she 
originally comes up with this idea of white fragility. So Robin D'Angelo is the person who coined this term. So there's nobody that we should be going to to understand this term more than her because she coined it 2011. And this is what she said. Whiteness studies begin with the premise that racism and white privilege exist in both traditional and modern forms. And rather than work to prove its existence, work to reveal it. This article will explore the dynamics of one aspect of whiteness and its effects, white fragility. Now, that's exactly what you were talking about a moment, moment ago, Josh, when you said, hey, look, you know, I kind of start with this idea that it exists, and so you can't challenge it. And I think that's part of the reason why white fragility is so difficult to challenge because it's our, you know, she's coming at this, uh, coming to it with the idea that all these things exist. Now it's just up to us to reveal it. Like the conversation's over, you didn't get a say, and anything you say will be evidence to support my point. Yeah. Uh, it's intellectually dishonest at best. Right. And, and just so that I'm going I'm to give some more quotes here because I want people to realize that it's not as simple as just saying, hey, white people got some defensive behaviors that they need to work on. Because I would agree with that. And I would agree with that for anyone um, in, in any context. You go to the workplace and you see that some people have defensive behaviors. You can't criticize them. Many marriages fail because people have these defensive behaviors and they can't be criticized. You know, they get very angry, right? And I, I think that exists also in the topic of race. So here's what she starts saying. She says, this book is unapologetically rooted in identity politics. Then a page later, she continues saying, throughout this book, I argue that racism is deeply complex and nuanced. And given this, we can never consider our learning to be complete or finished. So she's kind of already set it up to say like, look, this is a really, really deep, complex. There's so many nuances. And you know what? We're never really going to be done talking about it. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Got, gotcha. So, um, so continuing on, she says this, a significant aspect of the white script derives from our seeing ourselves as both objective and unique. To understand white fragility, we have to begin to understand why we cannot be fully either. We must understand forces of socialization. Then she continues saying, By exp uh, but exploring these cultural frameworks can be particularly challenging in Western culture, precisely because of two key Western ideologies, individualism and objectivity. So a moment ago, Josh had said, hey, you know, I like to be objective when I start out, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I've got a discipline that has taught me to be objective when I'm evaluating information that's unfamiliar to me. So right now, she's our, you know, we've moved from just, ah, people are uncomfortable to, okay, here's all these reasons why. One is we have this ide ideology of individualism and objectivity. So our scope is creeping, but it goes even further because it said, the book says, uh, uh, she tells us that individualism, quote, claims that there are no intrinsic barriers for individual success and that failure is not a consequence of social structures, uh, for, uh, but one of in, in individual character. According to the ideology of individualism, race is uh, irrelevant, end quote. So I disagree on this particular part with individualism, but we're going to get to that in my next point. So, okay. Josh. If somebody were to hear all that, they might say racism has deeper roots than you think. Would you agree with that? Well, that, the, that, that statement that racism has deeper roots. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll agree with that statement. OK. Um, you know, no. Can I scientifically define what that is? Right. No, not exactly. Um, <clears throat> but from her, her standpoint, how she enters her intro and she, she moves that scope, which is which is really interesting because she she even contradicts herself with, with her absolutism, with how right. she talks like the, the fragility exists. That's my posit. This is what it is. Right. But yet it can include all these other things and all this nuance that I'm not going to dare talk about. And if we right. actually question that nuance, um, you know, it's just proof of your fragility. Right. Um, do you want me to go on about sociology now? <laughs> sure, you know? sure. So, so everybody, Josh has some strong feelings on sociology. So let's, uh, okay. let's hear them feelings. Uh, all right. So look, 
when we talk about science and what is a science, even that could be a little bit gray as to what we define. But as so far as I look at it is, is a scientific method uh, deployed uh, where was this scrutinized along the way for evidence? Was the evidence primary? Was it tertiary? Uh, right. What is it we're talking about now? When we get into to the the mental sciences, psychology and sociology, mm -hmm. those get grouped together quite often. Okay. As as if they are. Now there are some similarities with individual versus group dynamics, uh, but psychology. Uh, we could measure psychology. Um, okay. and, and by that, I mean, we could take blood levels. Uh, we can do uh, functional MRIs. Right. Uh, we could do CAT scans. We can see the, the, the morphology of the brain. We can, uh, um, we can analyze all these things uh, mm -hmm. uh, with our neural architecture to find out what's going on. If there's a, a disease state, what, right. So psychology uh, is more of a, it, it's less gray than you think. It's not uh, shrinks and poofs. And, you know, there, there is some black and white metrics that we mm -hmm. use. Now, in, in science, uh, when we're talking about um, establishing a known truth, right? we have to be able to uh, scrutinize these things objectively, as in real objectively, not with how she likes to use the, uh, the word. And I'm, I'm going to stay away from the individualism thing. He said he's going to t cover that in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to it. We have to scrutinize things objectively. Right. Sociology does not do that. Uh, most people will assume at this point in time, especially coming out of the last century, where uh, the movements of sociology and socialism and these collectivist thought processes mm -hmm. have become pervasive. Um, People don't realize that sociology is a new concept and uh, relatively intellectually speaking. Um, mm -hmm. this, the founders of sociology is uh, Karl Marx and Durkheim. Pe people, they don't group those two together. They think politics is something completely different. Well, politics okay. is just the science of human interaction and how we organize right. amongst ourselves. Sure, sure. So, I mean, in, in essence, when you boil it down, that's what it is. And there is some science behind that, obviously. Um, but it's a subjective science because our reactions with each other are, are subjective. Mm -hmm. um, and she, so she writes this book rooted in philosophies of Durkheim and Marx. And right off the bat, when she says that my entire premises is based upon identity politics, mm -hmm. um, right off the bat, right off the bat, you, you, you understand that where she's putting her barriers. Her barriers are not rooted in anything science. Identity right. politics is a facade. It's not real. It's not biological. I can't measure it. So now you, she's trying to use, she's trying to blend opinion, subjective opinion and science uh, really hard. And like any good that could come out of sociology, it's, it's not going to come out of, out of this book. Her, her actually, her PhD uh, that she received, um, she, she got her, um, what was her bachelor's in? I can't remember what her bachelor's is in, but her PhD, uh, her, her thesis that she wrote was whiteness and racial dialogue was mm -hmm. the name of it. And I don't know if you, if you went back and you looked at any of her thesis. I didn't, uh, I did not uh, look. If you think that the wordage and the assumptions of white guilt or white fragility were thick in the book, they're even worse in her thesis. Um, I gotcha. You know, so anyhow, uh, she puts it, it's inf unfalsifiable is what what situation she's put in where you get defensive for the claim of white fragility. Right. That's a, a sign of your guilt. And then that fosters a, a, a blowback, which every cause has an effect. Right. Or, and then every effect has a cause. Uh, you know, right. it, it's it's all become that that temporal cycle. Right. So because we get defensive, which is a natural state of people who are charged with something that they disagree with, um, that facilitates, I think she called it white racial control. Okay. Um, and then that creates a cycle where we refuse to engage. Right. right? And which goes back into point number one, where I, I think this is self-defeating in the overall conversation of race. I think uh, so. 
fragility is. So I'll let you continue on. That's all. I just wanted to go on oh, my gotcha. little tirade about sociology. I think uh, when we put ology at the end of something, uh, people automatically give it some sort of measure of authority just because mm -hmm. they think it's a study of something. It's like Scientology. Oh, it, it must be intellectual. Oh, no, right. it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that. Right. Um, so, OK. All right. I, I'm, I'll get off my soap. No, here. no, that's good. good. It was a great. And yeah. Yeah. You know what? You know what? And, and I would I would absolutely like if if Dr. D'Angelo was here, I, I, I would I would say the same thing to her. Sure. Um, absolutely. I, I would I would. Um, it'd be an interesting conversation. It, it, it would. We'd, um, we'd probably be accused of a number of different things. And, you know, maybe some of them might be true, but I think might be true for different reasons than uh, yeah. D'Angelo posits herself. And it's interesting, the, the quote tirade that you went on just a moment ago, and you'd mentioned Marx, because I'm, you know, it seems to be the buzzword of the day, like, oh, just call something communism, or, you know, Karl Marx, or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but that leads to the next quote, the next citation from her own work. And this, uh, this quote now, it comes from her 2011 paper. Now, keep in mind, in 2011, she wrote this paper called White Fragility. And this was this idea that she had come up with after uh, having studied white, uh, been engaged in whiteness studies, okay? So here's what she says, quote, the disavowal of race as an organizing factor, both of individual white consciousness and the institutions of society at large is necessary to support current structures of capitalism and domination. For without it, the correlation between the distribution of social resources and unearned white privilege would be evident. The existence of structural inequality undermines the claim that privilege is simply a reflection of hard work and virtue. Therefore, inequality must be hidden or justified uh, as uh, resulting from lack of effort. And then she says, individualism accomplishes both of these tasks. Now that's a mouthful. So we're gonna summarize it. Cause I like to try to summarize things down and make it real simple so you can walk away and just understand it in your mind. So here's what it's, here's, here's my summary. White fragility prevent, prevents us from recognizing white privilege and the correlation between white privilege and the distribution of social resources would be more obvious except for capitalism and domination which are supported by individualism and subjectivity. And this is what I mean by it's just too complex, it's overly complex. And this is why when somebody says, hey, this sounds a lot like Marx, Marxist ideology, it's not just this rampant claim of, you know, oh my goodness, it's a red scare, communism, run everybody. No, this is literally coming out of her own work. And that's, and, and it's presented as if, you know, it's like in the, in the video clip, she doesn't go into all that. And I get it. It's, a, you know, a five minute video clip in totality. But I think that's part of the problem is that it, it's presented as if, OK, you've got some responses that uh, are preventing you from hearing somebody else. OK, fair enough. Um, and, 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 that, and that's something that we could have a conversation on. Um, but uh, but then it goes even further and it starts including all these other things like individualism, individualism, objectivity, uh, capitalism, domination, yeah. all this stuff. It's like, wow, the scope is just ex expanded once yeah. we dig in. And that's what makes it so hard because people that are disagreeing with white fragility, unless they've studied this material, they're not ready for that part of the conversation. And so people that have studied it, they understand all this information. And so you've got this asymmetry in the knowledge of the roots of white fragility and what I think makes it too complex. Oh, well, the, the overly complex nature of it is exactly the point. Right. That's, it's, it's too designed. Now, um, I'm not throwing out some false red scare here. This is intellectual disciplines, sociology. Mm -hmm. um, that's Marx. That's right. Durkheim. That's, that's not an intellectual debate. Now, what people think that... Um, when they think of communism or they think of Marxism, their mind automatically goes to politics. Well, that tells right. me they probably haven't really studied Marx very much. Um, the whole concept of the collectivist of the mm -hmm. communist manifesto is to find root in the masses. Right. Uh, in the, so how you do that is you legitimize sciences mm -hmm. that support your notion. That's what sociology is. 
that's how sociology has found itself in our uh, in academia right uh, uh throughout that that is the cancer it's not the political ideology that you defeat out in the open right it's, it's literally the miracle growth that we're putting on our roots of intellect young intellectuals we're throwing this right. this sociology collectivism gray science group think right. on the people and we've been doing it since the turn of last century so when you say like Oh, you're talking about a, a, a red scare or an attack on that's exactly what it is. Right. And identity politics, it is not the objective is not to ever be clear. It is to obfuscate what they're trying to say and to constantly right. shift that scope. Correct. That, that that is that is collectivism tactic 101. Um, because if you can't nail down a topic, if you can't nail something down, you can't debate it. And if you can't debate it, you can't circumvent it or beat or, or beat it. In right. this case, with D'Angelo, uh, as you said, your white fragility—you know—you just have it, and your defensiveness is a proof that it's not there. And right. since you have white fragility, you are incapable of recognizing your own white privilege. Right. So right off the bat, okay. So you have white privilege. So, so we've shifted now from fragility to privilege. Right. I mean, that that's even that alone is a monumental shift, but she did so pretty seamlessly, if I'm not mistaken. It's like this right. is implied. Right. This is an this is another implied truth off of mine. And then what she does is brilliant. You, you do have legitimate issues in this country. You do have people who are legitimately feeling the brunt of racism. Mm -hmm and of, of discrimination. And you and I can sit here and talk about, we legitimately have systemic racism built into the form of the war on drugs, uh, built into occupational licensing. We've gone off. So there are right. truths to what she's saying, but any, like I said, any great lie, any great lie, they use a little bit of truth as its pillars to, to move forward. And, and that's, that's what she's done. You know, it's right. just disingenuous. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you go on, but uh, look at it's, that. He's segueing, he's segueing yeah. already with the word disingenuous. Oh, there we go. I planned that's it. The, that is the next part. Remember, I said overly complex, I said disingenuous, and then uh, contributes, contributes to, to cult ignorance. A, a cult of ignorance. So, the yeah. next point is that, uh, that, that what's going on here is that it's disingenuous, and I say that because it presents the notion that white fragility, when you recognize it, um, and addressed, can improve race relations but it's strongly correlated with the distribution of resources, which doesn't really have much to do with race relations, at least not by everyday people's standards. So I'm calling that kind of like an ivory tower bait and switch. You know, it's like, I've, you know, I'm, I'm in the ivory tower and I throw out this bait, somebody grabs it and then I switch it on them, you know? And, and I think that's exactly what's going on. But, uh, but I think the problem is that, uh, that she has a lot of assumptions in the book and her paper that are not only incorrect and disingenuous, but I'd say they're actually out of touch with reality. And so we'll start with this particular claim. She says, individualism claims there are no intrinsic barriers to individual success. And I think while others may want to focus on the deeper rooted issues of Marxism and sociology and, and, and those sort of things, I like to talk in terms of everyday people. And so I look at this and I say, well, I think the individualism part is where I would disagree with D'Angelo the most. And I consider myself an observationalist. You know, I draw conclusions from a variety of observations, uh, whether I've read them, observed them, heard about them, what have you. And instead of saying that there are no intrinsic barriers to individuals uh, that, that, that prevent individual success, I observe that society actually celebrates individualism because of those intrinsic barriers. Mm -hmm. And let me give you a few examples. Last year, during, you know, I had my midweek moments that I was doing last year on the audio only version of the podcast. And during Black History Month, I discussed several individuals that uh, I thought were interesting and that I thought, hey, if I didn't, you know, if I wasn't familiar with them, maybe some other people were. Uh, and those people are Lieutenant Commander Wendell Brown, who was the first African-American to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. 
then I spoke about U.S. Bar uh, Marshal Bass, who is the first um, um, African-American U.S. Marshal. And then my favorite of the three was Bessie Coleman, who is the first African-American, Native American, and woman to get her aviation license and perform as a stunt flyer. And then each one of them has a really an amazing story, how they overcame the barrier of racism in their time to, mm -hmm. to, to do something, to accomplish something that we're now inspired of. And, yeah. and to, to kind of uh, buttress my point a little bit about that's not how I observe individualism, consider this quote from William Powell, who was a fellow African-American aviator to Bessie Coleman. And she, she had died, unfortunately, in an aerial stunt that she was performing. Uh, I think she was like 32. And this is like in the 1920s now, mind you. This is not like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or you know, even 50 years ago. This is like you know, you know, 100 years ago. So he says this, because of Bessie Coleman, we have overcome that which was worse than racial barriers. We have overcome barriers within ourselves and dared to dream, end quote. So, I mean, think about that for a minute. Like back in the 1920s when she wasn't even allowed to be, uh, to have a pilot's license because she was black, she was Native American, and she was a woman. So three strikes against her, right? Um, and, and at this point, her work that she did, that she overcame in spite of those barriers was, you know, summarized by, uh, by a, a fellow pilot in saying, hey, she taught us how to overcome uh, the thing within ourselves, you know, and, and dare to dream, you know, which they called worse than, than a racial barrier. So, and it's not that they weren't there. They were certainly there, obviously, because you can't overcome something that doesn't exist. It doesn't, that wouldn't even really make sense, you know. Um, and, and we can extend this to other Americans. You know, they don't have to necessarily be black or people of color. Uh, you've got Helen Keller, Theodore Roosevelt, people overseas in different countries, Anne Frank, Marie Curie, Beethoven, many, many people. Mm -hmm. They inspire us today because of their stories of facing some level of adversity, right? So to me, yes. that's what individualism celebrates, is it celebrates this this notion that yes, there is a barrier, whatever it is, could be a, uh, a gender barrier, it could be a barrier against your sex, your race, could, you know, it could be any number of things. But when there's a barrier, and somebody overcomes it, later down the line, um, what they've accomplished is what we find inspiring for that very mm. reason. Yes. Completely so, agree. Um, I think the biggest, uh, I, think, I think the biggest example that she gives in there was the story of Jackie Robinson. And I spent a great deal of time looking up information and reading about Jackie Robinson. Uh, but she says this, she says, the story of Jackie Robinson is a classic example of how whiteness obscures racism. Robinson is often celebrated as the first African American to break the color line and play in Major League Baseball. While Robinson was certainly an amazing baseball player, uh, amazing baseball player, the storyline depicts him as racially special, a black man who broke the color line himself. The subtext is that Robinson finally had what it took to play with the whites, as if no black athlete before him was strong enough to compete at that level. And that's, that's what, uh, that's what D'Angelo has to say about Jackie Robinson. And mm -hmm. the problem with that is it's neither uh, neither my experience nor my observation. More importantly, no. it's a wild deviation from the actual series of events. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's almost Are like you familiar with real, them? Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like uh, I, I grew up a huge baseball fan, right? Ah, baseball, gotcha. you know, and I actually played college baseball too at Ohio University, and I, I the game of baseball is a national pastime, you know. Okay. And, um, yeah, you know, did she forget that, or she probably doesn't even, she probably doesn't even know that it existed, but we had, we had the, the, you know, the Negro leagues, right. You know, and that's what they were called, you know, and they were very, very good. I mean, there was a lot of great baseball and I, I don't think anybody at the time thought that all oh, they couldn't play baseball on the level. It was called segregation. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. You know, it, it's, and Jackie Robinson wasn't just that he broke a barrier. That is one of the best baseball players ever to grace the diamond. Right. You know, to me, it's like you're marginalizing people. Uh, Absolutely. Retroactively to suit your agenda. No, Jackie Robinson, excuse me, was a badass baseball player. Right. Regardless of, of you know, 
any kind of skin, any kind of label you want to put on him. Oh, he right. played for this team or whatever. No, it, he was a great baseball player. And hey, what? I, and- I, I, you know, go ahead. I, I just, oh, yeah. it frustrates me because like, you know, we, it is tough and we're not having the, the race conversations right. that we should be having, but this kind, this level of, um, you said it was disingenuous. That's right. exactly what it is. This level of it actually would take us, if we listen to her, it would take us steps back. I you think know, so. there, are, there are people throughout all of history, uh, you know, Amer- let's just stick with American history. Uh, just because the civil rights movement didn't happen until the 60s does not mean that all of a sudden beforehand, there wasn't a plethora, a plethora of uh uh, African Americans who did these amazing things on their own, who right. broke these ceilings, and we should celebrate them in, in, right. the, in their own regard. Don't marginalize people right. uh, to suit an agenda. I think it's disingenuous. Right. Well, not only marginalize them, but also marginalize the the actual story as it played out. Because in the yeah. case of Jackie Robinson in 1945, when Branch Rickey um, hired him, and Branch Rickey is the man who owned the uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he set out and he had these tryouts for this fictitious team called the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. But there was actually no such team. What he was doing is he was looking for a player who had two distinct qualities. One, they had to have the skill. Uh, um, and, and, and like you said, there were, a many, uh, there were many people that had skill to compete yeah. just you know, objectively in baseball against white people. Um, yeah. So that wasn't the fullness of it. The second part was he uh, was looking for somebody that had the temperament to break the color line. And if anybody's watched the movie 42, there's like a three minute clip in there. And it's played, uh, Brent Tricky is played by Harrison Ford and he's grilling Jackie Robinson. He's like, you know, do you have the, um, uh, do you have the strength? Uh, and he's like, he's, he basically tells him like, you need to be able to keep your mouth shut. You know, he's, yeah. he's very abrupt and, ru- and, and rough in it. And then Jackie's like, are you saying that, you know, you want me to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, how did he say? I'm trying to remember how he said it, but he, he kind of questions back and pushes back a yeah. little bit. And Harrison Ford as brand tricky says, look, what I want is you to have the tenacity, the strength to ignore it and move on because anything you do is going to be used against you. And so the way we're going to break this color line is for you to behave in a way that people aren't expecting. And that's what's going to win them over, you know. And so it was his skill and his quality of character that gave him that opportunity. And there wasn't any subtext about him being a black man that just finally had what it took. Because that subtext would suggest that we're all sitting around thinking that black people just couldn't do the job. And and certainly there were some. I mean, obviously, we are talking about the 1920s. And I'm sure there was quite a few people who were absolutely racist and just would, even in even in the face of evidence would be like, whatever, black people can't play, right? Like, I'm sure there are some of those people uh, at this time, but the people in the know, the people that are g- moving to try and break this color line, that's not their attitude at all, no. you know? No, I, and so it, it, it and now that we more, know the story. Yeah, it would have been more uh, genuine of D'Angelo to approach how they tried to groom Robinson. Right. To, to act and to conduct as if his level of conduct was not civilized right you know that that would be and instead it, it perpetuates the notion of inferior superior beings by saying you know they couldn't physically do it which right it's just an outright lie i mean that's that wasn't even the, the concept at that point in time you know uh and not to go into that too much but it, it's you know it, it was unfortunate um right that's an excellent movie by the way 42 um Excellent movie, but you know, similar thing was happening in the National Football League. You know, with uh, right. th- at that point in time, it was the American Football League where you was having the the integration, uh, you know, of of the black athlete in, into the sports and um, her her, her uh, reality that she presents that it was some sort of big social ceiling that we thought that they couldn't compete physically. Right. It just doesn't exist. That doesn't, right. it never, it didn't happen that way. Right. Right. You know, and, and it's not to say that, that some people don't believe that, like some people might have believed that, but when you're talking yeah. about the story of somebody and well, then some you go people back, believe the earth is flat too. So, right. When I mean, you go back to the original story and you say, what were the people who were involved thinking 
and what do we know now and how do we celebrate things? I think it's, I think it's very disingenuous. But she doesn't stop there because she's also a disingenuous in some of the terms that she uses. For example, the term racism or racist. You know, a lot of people might suggest that she, she's basically calling people immoral or, um, you know, uh, or racist, you know, in some subtle way or maybe in an overt way. But she says this about racism. She says, quote, in the post-civil rights era, we have been taught that racists are mean people who intentionally dislike others because of their race. Now, again, as an observationalist, that's not my experience, and I, and I suspect it's not yours either, of how people define racism. Now, when you go out and you ask people what racism is, people, you'll get a lot of different answers. But when you listen more to the conversation that people are having, then I think you get a better clue as to how they think of racism, right? Um, and I think that's your that that's where you you're going to want to focus your energy is not necessarily how people will tell you when you specifically ask them, but how they behave uh, when they're not being asked, when maybe they're not being judged or they don't think they're being judged, you know. Um, yeah. and, and we see this, uh, you know. I see that generally speaking, people think of racism is when you think of somebody who is either inferior or superior uh, at a particular thing because of their race. And, yeah. and that's why we've had over many years all these arguments on things like IQ and athletic skill and uh, maybe even group behaviors. You know, it used to be the case that people thought like black people were lazy or that, uh, you know, or today we think of, you know, Mexicans as hardworking. You know, we, we think Asians are good at math. We think Jews are great bankers. We think all these absurd things, um, but they all have one core component. And that's peop that is, that's this assumption of some sort of superior or inferior um, uh, uh, innate skill or, yeah. you know, you know or, or, uh, or attribute, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, or attribute that people have. Um, and so when she says, we just think of it as people who, you know, who, who uh, how'd she say, who just dislike somebody. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I don't, I don't think that too many people, I think that's how she might, or maybe how early progressives kind of framed the context of, you know, racism is, oh, you just dislike somebody because they're black, you know, but I think when, you know, people who are accused of being racist, um, when, when you look at how they understand racism, it's not how she describes it. And that's very disingenuous. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's weaponizing um, race is what it is. Right. And, and she told you that at the beginning of the book. Right. I mean, very clear. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm full fledged identity politics. Yeah. Um, you know, that is, that's what that is. I mean, uh, there's no other way to read it. It, it. Like, what would be the purpose of breaking you down by identity in politics? Mm -hmm. I mean, just start with that initial presumption. Right. If we're all American citizens, what is the point of breaking you down into, gr into groups? Right. It's because either one, you, you know, that there's some sort of division already. Uh, and you can prove it, which uh, she doesn't even attempt to do that. She just makes a claim and it is there. Um, hold on. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm doing my Liberty dad thing. <laughs> right, right. We're, we're both dad's people. So give us a little bit of yeah. a break. Um, so I don't know. It, she doesn't really ever define racism. You know, she does, you know, she talks about it, but she, she expands it so far. Right. Uh, to, to where, like, like you said, it goes back into point one where it's overly complex. Right. Um, you know, and I don't know, I'm not trying to jump ahead here, but it's. Um, no, no, no. I think it's a good point to, to talk about because that's the, that's part of the problem is that when you, when, yeah. when everyday people define something, they generally define it in, you know, a sentence or two, you know, but when you, when you get some of these more progressive type people who are trying to create these intellectual uh, uh, overreaching it's ideas. It's a quagmire. It, it's supposed it, to be confusing yeah. is what it is. Because if, if it's like I typed back in before with the, the science of sociology and Marx and right. Durkheim, you know, it, it is supposed to be confusing. You're supposed to obfuscate because right. that, that's, that's the objective. Here's the thing. If you read a book like this, and I'm just going to say it like it is, if you think that she's writing this in good faith, Mm -hmm. You've made a mistake. 
right? You, you know, not all intellectual conversations are in good faith. And, and right. I think a lot of intellectuals, a lot of thinkers, they go wrong with that because they, they, they look at something and they want to, that they approach it like I do, uh, look for the merits. Right. Well, you're assuming the author is writing this in good mm -hmm. faith. Right. That's not the case. And eventually you cross a line where like, okay, this is disingenuous. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a little absurd. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, it's on purpose. Right. I mean, it's not an accident. You know, this lady has a PhD. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you, I don't, I don't even care if it's in basket weaving. You don't get a PhD by just being a mouth breather. Right. So her, her intent is purposeful here. This is an obfuscation of reality is what it is. Right. And, and, and I think that's where we get into the next point. You've got this obfuscation that's going on. And when we say that, what we mean is, you know, if you go back earlier when I said, okay, what is white fragility? And then we just kept reading and kept reading and kept reading. And the definition kept expanding um, or it started including more things. Or in order to understand this other thing, you had to say, okay, what does she mean by this? Okay, well, now she means this whole other uh, ball of wax. And so then yeah. you just keep going and going and going. And I believe that leads to what I call or what Asimov calls the cult of ignorance. And, yeah. you know, he wrote this about this attitude of disdain that people had toward the intellectual um, and educated part of society. And in, in a certain context, yes, he would be correct that a lot of people, um, you know, un, uh, unnecessarily have these bad attitudes toward that. But I think that intellectuals uh, play a role in that. They're, they're not uh, just going along, learning stuff and saying, man, I can't believe that people are um, uh, are, are acting this way. They're contributing, contributing to it, I think, actively. You know, oh, and if yeah. you remember, oh, I goodness, think it was yeah. episode seven, I, uh, Jeers to Cheers, where, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm discussing and I go over just uh, like a couple of decades worth of headlines where, you know, all this academic stuff came out and it was like, you know, are you a conservative? You might be lower IQ, you know, stuff like that. You know, this is there's this attitude that um, from intellectuals that us little people don't have what it takes to be on their level and they sometimes are outright about it and sometimes they're just writing so much and then being so expansive that between those two why wouldn't people have a little bit of an irritation and say you know what that's just you know that, that's just all those philosophers you know just sitting around philosophizing and just thinking up stuff you yeah. know like that's this attitude that people have. And I, you know, that's why I'm saying like, look, we need to break that. We need to say, look, everybody can be an intellectual. And one of the first things we need to do is say, look, some of you intellectuals, you're not nearly as intellectual as you like to think you are. You're just running around in a bunch of circles trying to keep us chasing you, Yeah. you know? Um, well, and then, go ahead. The, you, you mentioned the cult of ignorance. I mean, it's it, just knowledge in general, uh, if, if it gets uh, conflated or, there's a lot of power in knowledge. There's a lot of power in obviously in politics and it's intrinsically tied into our social cultures that we have right. with one another. And what has really happened this past century of we we've learned how to, and this is one of the geniuses of Marx. Now we talk about merit. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, quite a bit of element of genius of how you can, the power, the power of the collective uh, is we've seen the atrocities that a collective mm -hmm. power can do right. this past century. But previous to this past century, collectivist movements weren't really a thing. Um, you know, they had movements and revolutions and things, but they, they, they weren't based upon really identity politics in mass. Mm -hmm. Now, are you familiar with phenomenology and... Uh, and, and the uh, analytical philosophies. Somebody uh, mentioned it, it, it once to me, but I've not really. I, I know. It. I just, I just brought this way out of left field. It, it's, it's one of the things that I, it, it ties into collectivism and it ties into social engineering and uh, long story short, it comes down to uh, controlling the narrative mm -hmm. and in controlling the narrative. Uh, one of the first things that if you're trying to push a collectivist notion, is to uh, control the educated class, or at least have a good segment of them where you've got the letters, the PhDs, those, the authorities. Right. 
you know, you, you get that class, you get PhDs running around saying these things like white fragility, or you get PhDs running around talking about uh, climate change or, or whatever the topic may be. You give this artificial validity to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you talk about contributing to the cult of ignorance. Anything that does not highlight critical thinking skills. Right. Um, and that's to me, that's our problem. Um, we don't have critical thinking skills. We see someone who is a PhD in sociology and they wrote a book. Well, they must be smart, right? Right. And they must know what they're talking about right. and they're on TV and they've got money. So th- you have, when you have people who lack those critical thinking skills, who lack the ability to scrutinize things, which we can all dive into that and talk about our public education system. They read things that are written by supposed professionals and they'll take it as truth. Mm-hmm. So things like this do contribute to the cult of ignorance uh, in a massive way. And, um, and they're like, Oh, what do you want to do about it, Josh? Well, I, I don't want to burn any books. I don't want to uh, uh, quite the opposite. I want us to read them. I want us to call them out, honestly, like what we're doing. Yeah, and uh, I, I, yeah. I want to attack the meaning. Let's put the words aside. What are they meaning? Now, if I sit down with Mrs. D'Angelo, Dr. D'Angelo, I mean, I could sit here and basically I've sat here with you and told, I thought her book was, was not very good, but what does she want? Mm-hmm. What are you, what are you trying to, what kind of society are you trying to achieve? Right. I bet if you got someone to boil it down and we sit here and talk, I wouldn't be surprised if what we want is the same thing as her. You know, are, are we talking past each other? Do we, we want right. to live in a society where, uh, you know, co- skin, you know, your skin color is just, is just a thing. Like I've mentioned before, like hair color, it's, it's just a phenotype. It's all it mm-hmm. is. Um, if she wants that, then we could find common ground to move to. Uh, but the problem is, is I highly doubt that that would uh, suffice for her uh, because it ties into, uh, I tie this all the way back around into you create a problem that doesn't exist right. and then you obfuscate it. And I tie this all the way back into the executive orders you and I talked about before where they're fact finding missions. Right. These are all political agendas. Sure. And it, it, someone who is genuine about their intentions. Like I I want to fix race relations. They would be willing to engage you on this and things wouldn't be so obscure. Uh, People who are constantly shifting the goalposts really aren't having the best of intentions, in my opinion. No, I, I, I think you're right. And I think that leads to, you know, another point under this cult of ignorance, you know, in the last episode, not the last episode, but back in episode 34, uh, we, we took a 45-minute speech from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his speech titled The Other America, and I cut out 11 minute se- an 11-minute seg- segment, and then I just kind of walked through, and I said, all right, what am I hearing Dr. King say? And, you know, that 11 minutes gave me more profound understanding of the issues of race relations than I think reading this entire book did. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, and, and I think part of that is because he got to the point and he didn't keep expanding the scope. He didn't say, OK, we'll end this, too. And this. Oh, and by, by this, I mean this other, you know, <laughs> I'm going to define this one particular word that you're not familiar with in such a way that it enco- that it has to encompass all this other stuff. No, no. He was very to the point. And, you know, so like, you know, if we want to talk about like what did we learn from Dr. King's 11 minutes? Well, we can just say that one, he defined racism in like two sentences. Yeah. Uh, and he told me what racism was and what it wasn't, something that doesn't happen here. In this book, D'Angelo never says, oh, by the way, here are some examples of things that people think are white fragility and they're really not. Nope. Mm-hmm. Everything was all about this is white fragility, this is white fragility. And it's basically, you know, if you are being defensive, and for any reason, like she never describes a situation where somebody might be um, defensive and correct. It doesn't exist. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the, the respect for potential opposition is not right. there. Right. And, and, but Dr. And, King and that, does that. Yeah, Dr. King does that, you know, and it's uh, th- that's the difference between someone who is genuine and someone who is not. 
Right. And then he, he goes on further to tell us, I mean, because, you know, I'm not done with all the stuff that we learned in this like 11 minutes because it was quite a bit. You know, oh, yeah. he, he goes on saying that, hey, here is why the black community is frustrated and they're angry. Um, and, and in that, if you remember, if you if anybody's watching has seen the previous one, it was because they uh, the black community kept seeing things that were put out to try to help the black community. But then some other action would basically undo it. Right. Yeah. And then um, and then he condemns the actions of some black people and then also some of those of white people, because he's like, hey, you know what? I oppose riots, uh, but I also oppose the reasons that are leading up to and causing these riots. Uh, and then finally, he told he tells us where the disconnect between the uh, worldview of whites and the worldview of blacks is, you know, so he's basically saying, like, look, Everybody keeps talking about this white backlash, but I think that you've got it mixed up. What you see is white black backlash. We see is this other thing, right? Yeah. So now, now I'm in 11 minutes, just in a mere 11 minutes, you know, I've learned, you know, what racism is, what it isn't. Uh, I learned why, some of the reasons why the black community is so absolutely frustrated. I learned that, yes, he does oppose some things that I oppose, but also that I need some things I need to, you know, maybe maybe not me because I'm not in 1967, but, you know, as, you know, white people are doing things that they need to uh, evaluate because they're wrong. Um, and then finally he said, look, your perspective is this, our perspective is this. So all that in 11 minutes, right? So I feel like that, that went a lot further toward improving race relations. And, and honestly, I, I, I think there's evidence of that. Like, look where race relations are compared to where they were you know uh, but look how standoffish people are over just this idea right like you know like people don't even want to and, and i don't know maybe people didn't want to hear it back then either uh, i'm not no. quite as familiar with the uh with, with I, how- I would say i would say it's fair to say there was some resistance to dr king back right in the 60s yeah. <laughs> right 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 yeah. so um but but again uh, the the core of what he's saying versus the core of what she is saying i think is fundamentally different and I think it's because, like you said, he honestly wanted to do something for the black community. And he honestly wanted to see race relations uh, get to a positive light. And we hear that in some of his other speeches where he's like, you know, I had a dream, you know, and the white children are playing with the black children and so on and so forth. Right. So he, he really seems to have this very clear, distinct vision of a better world. But more importantly, he gets that information to us quickly without a lot of ambiguity and in some cases even saying okay i i I hear what you are saying here i understand this i understand that you have a problem with riots you know but let me tell you something about these riots that maybe you didn't consider you know and i think i think he does a, a a great service to race relations whereas as far as i've read the book the paper the concept hearing it from other people it doesn't doesn't do anything it just says hey here's this attitude that white people have and it seems to be almost uh, at their core um which yeah it, it's itself a bit racist it, no it actually it, one it'd be kind of hard not to define what she's saying as racist right um, right like i said it, it comes down to uh i'm not going to claim to know what her motivations or her intentions right. exactly are uh, but the fact is you can read her book and come away objectively, not knowing what her intentions are. Right. And you can listen to Dr. King for 11 minutes and you know exactly what his intentions are. Yep. And even though he's telling you there's a problem we need to address, you leave that with a, a measure of hope that I think is under undervalued in society. Right. He, Dr. King at the same time, he was a master orator, you know, mm-hmm he made you feel like a brighter future was possible. Right. Um, Dr. D'Angelo, when you got done reading it, especially as a white person, you're thinking that, Oh, it would just be better if I wasn't part of society. You know, it's not a hopeful, right. um, It's not a hopeful forward looking book. Um, You know, so completely different. I, I, you know, I, right. You know, but, we have you have to you have to address these types of um, 
you have to look at the, all literature. You have to look at what somebody said. Because if I would make the assumption, if I looked at that book, White Fragility, and I heard all the talk about it, but I didn't actually explore it myself, mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't have a complete understanding like you were you're right. talking before. So right. it's important for us to read things that we may, because what if we got into it and we found out, oh, what this person's saying actually is pretty good. Or right. they, have, they have some merit to what it is. And you didn't allow yourself that, intellectual exploration of the topic because of what other people were saying right um a, a guy on one of the other podcasts uh, that that's here on free speech media um I, I can't remember his name he was talking the other day but um he, he was he was mentioned along the lines of um what was i'll be there in a moment buddy <laughs> um he, he was he was mentioning along the lines of um uh, God, I, I just lost where I was at. I'm oh, that's sorry. all right. Well, we, we need to move along here a little bit. So just in case anybody it's thinks that, I'm, that we're being a little bit too harsh on Dr. D'Angelo, um, a moment ago, I suggested that what she says is a bit racist because she kind of has this idea that uh, she, she's talking about white fragility in this sense that it's almost, uh, you know, at the core of white people. And so um, think about what what Dr. King says in the Other America speech, where he describes racism specifically by calling by by saying this, he said it's the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately f- inferior. Okay, now D'Angelo, to be fair, she, she doesn't take it that far, but she really does, I think, ride the edge. So I want to play for you a moment uh, now for a moment the clip uh, of the Guardian interview uh, toward the end. Um, it's about a 45 second clip. And I just want you to hear this and then I'm going to uh, then we're going to talk about a couple of things and then we'll jump onto that bill review. The number one question I'm asked is what do we do? And before I answer that, I want to offer a couple of challenges to that question because I find it a very problematic question. So the first thing is to think long and deep about what it took for you to ask that question. How in 2020 Your question could be, what do I do about racism? How you have managed not to know and write down how you have managed to be a full functioning adult in 2020 and not know what to do about racism. And everything you write down will be your map and nothing you write down will be easy to address, but everything on it can be addressed and then get to work. All right. right, So... All right, so we're back. So uh, now that you've heard that, I want to I want you to keep in mind that this is what D'Angelo says uh, about her own experience. She says, "quote It took me several years to see beneath these reactions. At first, I was intimidated by them, and they held me back and kept me careful and quiet. But over time, I began to see what lay beneath this anger and resistance to discuss race or listen to people of color." End quote. And she's and when she worked as a diversity trainer, she admits that she was unable to identify the causes of behaviors that she was observing, saying this, I came to see that the way we are taught to define racism makes it virtually impossible for white people to understand it. And again, this is now me saying like this is one of the other reasons why I say she's being very, very disingenuous. So to her, I would simply ask this question, which is it? Is racism taught in such a way that it's virtually impossible for white people to understand it? Or, as in the video clip, should white people be embarrassed that in 2020, now 2021, they might be a, quote, fully functioning adult who doesn't know what to do about it? And so I think that kind of underscores this idea that what's going on um, in this conversation is more than meets the eye. and so I think that's I think that's something that people need to consider is that, you know, there's some contradictory stuff. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know if you have anything further to add on that, Josh. What one last little thing. The, the, Absolutely. The I had to go back and I kept rewatching that clip. Just just mm-hmm. the way that she was saying when she said that that what can I do? You know, when someone asked me, what can I do? And she says that even that question is problematic. Right. Um. I don't know what kind of intellectual dishonesty, how much mental gymnastics pretzeling you've got to do um, to, 
to make so it's just it's just ridiculous right <laughs> i don't i, mean, I, I don't yeah. even want to it's just cannot. look, look I, I i'm in professional circles all the time if anybody if someone at a table would have said such a thing it said like uh, you know e even the presumption of that question how they, i mean it's just should be laughed out of any any right serious academic room That's right well ridiculous. yeah especially especially if on one hand she's going to tell us that uh, you know, the, the way that society has gravitated toward, you know, the things that have been built up over time have made it such that, you know, whites can't see this issue, um, that they're going to be totally blind to it. Then you can't turn around and say, well, okay, well, in one sense, all these structures have been built and, and put up in such a way that you're going to be ignorant and blind, but then turn around and be like, seriously? How could you how could you be asking me that question right now like which is it you you, you know that's very very dishonest um, it's so, it, it, it's so dishonest so let me just add what one last thing here i'm sorry absolutely you know, you know i look like i said earlier i look at the human being as a biological entity first and foremost right. and it, you know that's the end all be all i could you right. know, we can prove that we're a biological entity you know stacks of information anything that we do as far as our actions externally mm -hmm. um unless it's from a first person point of view it's or unless you're measuring it by some kinetic device it is a subjective thing right now what she is saying is that white people are incapable of seeing this right now she's relying away and i'm just this is going to be a real quick nail on her coffin white people can't see this she's doing it from her subjective sociology standpoint right that's what she's saying what about my biology that makes me incapable of intellectually understanding the same thing as someone of a different color right. of skin right you can't prove it so what you're telling me is whatever truth that she wants me to know or believe mm -hmm. i actually have to learn it as an organism it doesn't make it real does it make it true right which that in itself it invalidates her entire argument right so case shut case shut everybody i hope you enjoyed this book review um you know i i think there's an argument to be made that much of the conversation on race today is a little bit about uh, it's it's about something more than race um, you know, a lot less about race and a little bit more about something else. What is that power. something else? Uh, yeah, it could you could narrow it down and say power is probably a number of different things. And I think that is the reason why we we all need to be engaged. We need to dig in and we need to see, OK, what are people saying and where do we agree? Where do we disagree? What makes sense? Is this is this being disingenuous? Is this being um, is, is being intellectually consistent? So on and so forth. And when we start asking these questions and we start digging in, I think that we'll we will be, uh, we will find ourselves coming to the truth a lot sooner than we would have otherwise. And with that, let's dive into a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. All right. So continuing with the theme of Black History Month, we're going to focus on bills this month that are related to the black community. And today we're going to really step out and we're going to review House Resolution H.R. 40, and it's titled Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for Af African Americans Act. So, Josh, you want to lead in, lead us in with this conversation about the H.R. 40. It's about uh, reparations. Yeah, it's um, this is uh, Sheila Jackson's bill, a Democrat mm -hmm. out of Texas. Uh, currently, I saw it's, it's been referred to a House Judiciary Committee. Um, there's a I went I've went through the 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 summary. Um, it's actually quite more extensive. I actually looked at the um, the the details of it. I, I saw this overview. It's going to cost. They project about twelve million dollars. Right. Um, there's no timetable uh, for completion uh, for this uh, commission, uh, but it is going to complete 90 days uh, after they submit the report. So I didn't see anywhere in there that told them how long they have to submit the report. 
So uh, I, I don't know if you saw that or not. I, you know, uh, but... I, yeah, we, we can get to that. Let me pause you okay. for just a second because I forgot to give the introduction to the bill review. And I want to make sure oh. everybody knows what the purpose of a bill. Why are we reviewing bills? The goal there of the you bill go. is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Now, Josh and I are not lawyers, so this is not a legal no. interpretation. And we may be wildly wrong. Bills range from a page or two up to thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is intended to be a little short. However, we do get chatty and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in with a little bit of your time. So now that we have properly introduced the bill review, you're talking about Sheila Jackson's bill and uh, continue at it. Because you're, yeah, I think, oh, I, I think it time, is a year. A timetable is it is about a year. I I, I know that at the cost, uh, it was a twelve million dollar cost. Right. Obviously, it's uh, they've got a list of objectives. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty much any. Uh, branch of the government that uh, is touched by the executive branch. They have the authority to sequester and get information from and facilitate. I think that was part of their, their scope right. of authority. Um, they want to identify the role uh, of federal and state governments in supporting right. slavery. And I found that interesting because it was federal and state governments. So I'm curious right. if they're going to hold individual states accountable for different things. Um, they want to study forms of public discrimination post-slavery uh, and three lingering negative effects. You know, one thing I found really interesting about this is uh, the, the bill itself, the, the name of it, you talk about reparations uh, mm -hmm. for African-Americans. Uh, just to be honest, I'm completely against reparations. Right. Uh, so when I, uh, you can't uh, reconcile past injustice by right. committing future injustice. Just it's a blanket truth. Um, but with that being said, I, I went ahead and I read through the bill and actually there's parts of this, um, that if I was optimistic, an optimistic person, I'd be actually hopeful for, I think it actually would be a good idea for the government to understand forms of public discrimination post-slavery. Maybe they'll stumble onto the formation of occupational licensing and the war on drugs. Um, Somebody's more hopeful than I. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, so I read into the words and I'm like, okay, but I know that that's not the direction they're taking it. But, uh, but me saying, I know that's subjective. Right. Uh, you know, looking at the words, there, there's some words in this that sounds good because I don't disagree that there's been public discrimination based upon race. Right. I don't disagree that there's been negative lingering effects, but the title uh, uh, reparations, I mean, no, nobody alive today was a slave, right? Uh, nobody alive today, unless they they actually have some sort of documented individual right. incidents where, and then that should be rectified through our court systems, whoever right. the, the, the grieving party was. Um, but reparations, like to me, it's it's political again. It's it's political theater. It's pandering identity politics for votes, and it's going to cost twelve million dollars. And this is a study. And I, even though they laid out things, when, when you put something down, one of the things they want to identify is the role of the federal and state government in supporting slavery. What does that mean? Like, how are we talking about supporting? So it, it, even in the bill itself, there, there's these general things they want to identify, mm -hmm. but it doesn't like identify. What do you mean by supporting slavery? What do you mean by public discrimination? As we get now, as we move into some of the executive orders that we've seen, the line between equity and equality has been blended. So if, if we're not, you know, are, is this a, another way of trying to pursue equal outcomes? Do, right. do, you, do you see where I'm going with like, I do. So, so even though I'm optim, I see some things and I want to be optimistic because I want things to be altruistic. And as they mm -hmm. seem, uh, problem is I'm not naive enough anymore to think that that's the case. So obviously I right. don't support this bill. Right. And, you know, just so we're clear, I want to, you know, mentioning reparations and not supporting it. You know, one of the big arguments that I've seen in favor of reparations is saying, Hey, look, because of all these things that have happened and we, we acknowledged them even earlier and back in, I believe it was episode 34, where we acknowledged that yes, the, you know, federal and state governments would go out and they would say, okay, we've done this, uh, we've treated the black community terribly. We're going to do this now 
as a way to compensate them for their loss or, you know, or, 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 or something that they didn't get or didn't receive or whatever. We're going to try to compensate them. But then, you know, we would turn around maybe and undo that or make some other, you know, rule or law that basically nullified, you know, the, that effort. You know, so it was kind of this back and forth, like, we're going to do something, but no, we're not. And, you know, and, and we, we just acknowledge that, right? And so this idea of, the, of reparations tends to be, if it were not for those things, if they had released people from slavery and just stayed out of the way and didn't create any more laws, then you would see um, more generational wealth today that we don't see. And um, and I think that I think there's a fair argument there. Yes, oh, that's that, probably yeah. true. But the question is, there are so many things involved with this generational wealth that it you I don't think you could just say had this been done, we would have seen this at a particular level, right? You would just say, well, we might see more than now. Okay, well, how much more than now? What exactly? Who exactly? What things would be different? And th those are the kind of questions where I don't think that you can answer them. So I don't think that this idea of reparations is a good idea. Um, but then you even have other issues. Like my wife is not a national. She's not from this country. She was naturalized barely over a year ago. And she grew up and spent the first 18 years of her life in a different country. And so if they were to say, we're going to give reparations to black Americans, well, first they got to figure out which black Americans um, come from a lineage that the generational wealth that we're talking about was out, uh, was out of their reach. Because mm -hmm. some black people, their families came from other countries after the time of slavery. So slavery didn't impact them um, in the same way that it might have impacted people whose lineage goes all the way back. Uh, but then you're talking about taking from some people. So you might say, okay, well, we're going to take from this particular family. Let, let's say you take from my family. And so now you're going to be taking some, something from somebody who came from an entirely different country on the other, literally the other side of the world, because my wife was born and raised in Indonesia. Uh, but then you still look at me, I'm uh, a, a great portion of me is Native American. So if you take from me, well, my ancestors uh, had a pretty rough go as well, putting it lightly, with the same government that mistreated the black Americans. So you would be taking from one people who suffered, or you know, one person to uh, give to another person who suffered. So I think it's just, I, I think the idea of reparations is terribly bad because mm -hmm. it's too complex to really go back and identify who, and there are too many unknowns to say how much, when, or where we would we should exceed a, a particular result, you know. Um, so I, I, I so I'm with you on the reparations, uh, but I think we just want to make sure that we under you know people understand that we recognize what people are saying when they say it's not just giving black people money. It's saying hey, there is something that has happened, and people are in a, in a situation that they would possibly not otherwise be. I I get that, and I think you do too, Josh. Oh yeah, of course I get that. But I mean, we can play the what if with all kinds of things. Right. What if the what if we didn't develop social security? You'd, you'd see probably thirty percent more generational wealth. Right. Um. You, you know, yes, there'd be a percentage of the population that it would have been different for. But you know, you can play the what if game over and over and over, and we can go back and talk about the uh, the minutia and the details of you know if this policy was different, uh, these communities would look different. Um, if the U.S. Army didn't, you know, ravage the Indians, you know, right. nation would look different. You know, your part, Indian, I'm my great grandma was Shawnee. You know, you're looking back, it's like you're going to extract from one person to give to another to right wrongs of the past. Look, history teaches us a lot of things if we will let it. Right. And as much as yesterday and the past, can leave a bad taste in our mouth, you know, from events that have happened that we had mm -hmm. nothing to do with. The only way to reconcile and move forward is to do so in the name of justice. Right. And you cannot have justice by committing injustice. Right. I, you know, I, I don't even like, 
I, I got to focus on with people because people always want to go back. Well, you know, what if there was an occupational licensing? Uh, what if Jim Crow laws didn't didn't happen? You know, what about the you know Reconstruction in the South and how terrible the the blacks? Look, look, yeah, the terror. I mean, it, it, you're not going to find many people who are going to objectively look at our history and say, you know what, these were good things, right? You know, w- this country's got scars, but we have nasty you know, ones, nasty, nasty ones. But until we get to the point where we, if we honestly, honestly want to have a society where Dr. King's vision is, is enshrined, where we are going to stop looking at the past, we can't turn and look at, at another human being and say, I'm extracting from you right. because you carry a gene that was present in someone who committed this atrocity in the past. Right. It, it, you know, Where's the justice in that? Right. No, there, 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 there isn't. And, and let's, let's be clear. Even if you think that reparations, not you, but even if somebody's watching and says, you know, I still think that reparations might have some merit. The question is, is this bill a good bill? Would it actually accomplish that? And no. I, I think the answer to that is a resounding no, because when you read it, you find out that the only thing that is guaranteed to come out of this bill is a commission that's like you said, going to spend $12 million to study racism. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and that's the only thing that's going to come out of it. And then, um, and then a report. Okay. And maybe some recommendations, but that doesn't mean that those recommendations will actually get put into play. Uh, But then it says that, you know, it, it starts to suggest that, Hey, Maybe um, uh, maybe a, a national apology for Black Americans is in order. Okay, maybe it is, uh, but it doesn't guarantee it. So this this bill wouldn't even give uh, Black Americans uh, 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 that apology, right? Um, and then, uh, am I thinking of this bill or I think of the other one? Um, no, I think no, you're right. You're, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's not even it doesn't. Right, right, right. Yeah, this I, is I, I, I think this at this point in time, like, and I. I'm not sure. I don't think I've not found that this has happened, that there's been a proclamation by Congress. Right. I would <laughs> I think a, a bill simply uh, and they do these kind of things all the time where they're just mm-hmm. platitudes like, hey, we want to congratulate so and so. And they sign it into laws just like a commemoration. You right. Know, how about doing something genuine to heal? Like, look, slavery, you know, make a big proclamation, a statement on slavery that it, it was evil. Uh, that human beings are not property, right? Um, you know, and make a position statement. Yeah, put it out. I, make it official. You know, we don't rest it. To, is money going? Is giving someone money right now by extracting it from someone else going to reconcile the past? Is it going to to fix four hundred years or longer of generational pain? No, no. But maybe an acknowledgement from the federal government, and, and I think that to, would be the extent that it should ever go. An acknowledgement right. that this body, this legislative body, at one point in time, absolutely violated human rights, right, and, and was complicit in such. And I, I think the point that really needs to be made is that this bill does put in there that you know, hey, they're going to look at maybe issuing a national apology. Well, the first thing that I that comes to my mind is um, do we really need a legislative bill and to spend 12, $12 million to come out and say, Hey, you know what the, the United States government in whatever form it was in, whether it was a national form or whether it was the 13 colonies, the, you know, the government, the government and governments in the, within the United States uh, did a horrible thing by a allowing one person to forcibly use another person um, and and dispose of them and treat them in the way that they did. And then two, um, it was horrible that not only did they let them do it, but in some cases, the government enshrined it into law, Yeah. right? Um, and so the question I have is like, we really need a study for that? We really need to spend $12 million? Why can't the president issue an executive order and say, you know what? I'm just going to do it. Does he who's going to stop him? I mean, if all he says is I'm issuing an executive order acknowledging 
that this is a horrible stain on the country. And I'm going to formally issue an apology to every single living and dead black uh, person that has lived in this country, whether they were, uh, whether they ended up becoming an American citizen or not, because they died before they got that opportunity, right? And you know, if he says, uh, if he said something like that, nobody would stop him. Nobody in their right mind would stop him. And he could create that executive order all day, every day. So the way I look at it, if he wanted to do that, he already would have. It'd be applauded from. It'd be applauded right. from uh, from everyone. Right. And uh, but you know why he's not going to do that. Oh, it's it's all talk to keep people divided. Um, it's political theater. It's political theater. Uh, and, and, and so we're clear because I don't want anybody to watch the show and I don't want anybody to say, oh, it's a white guy and a white ish looking guy that seem to just, you know, it's easy for them to sit in their comfy chairs and talk this way. I like to look at bills, all bills. In the, you know, it, whether it's an executive order, whether it's a bill, a mandate, it doesn't matter. I like to look at them and I say, what is the purpose? What is the action going to be taken? And how do I measure it? Right. And here, the only action that's going to be taken that I'm very, very clear on when I read this bill is that they're going to create a commission of people. And this commission of people are going to go out and they're going to study racism. But when you read the bill, and I encourage people to read it, it's HR 40, read the bill and look at some of the things that is already that are already affirmed in this bill. So it goes through, and I've, I've got a couple of them here. Um, here's what it says. Four million Africans and their descendants were enslaved in the U.S. and its colonies between 1619 and 1865. Okay, that's pretty much fact. Don't know anybody that's going to argue with that. Between 1789 and 1865, the Constitution and various laws permitted slavery in the U.S. Okay, verifiable fact there. That happened. No disagreement. Slavery deprived Africans of their life, liberty, and their current citizenship rights from their own respective countries and their cultural heritage and denied them their fruit of the, the fruit of their own labor. Totally agree. No argument there, right? On and on and on. There's a number of different things and, and that it already affirms. So why do we need to spend $12 million when many of these things are already in the bill, acknowledged, and have already been widely acknowledged not only in the history books but by society at large nobody's nobody worth paying attention to is arguing about four million africans having been enslaved in this country not that i am aware of right no. nobody no you know so it's it's affirming things that we already agree with it's spending money and it doesn't produce any guarantee there's no guarantee of a reparation there's no guarantee of a national apology there's no guarantee of anything other than in, a, I believe it's a year, where this group is going to hand over a proposal for the president to review. Mm -hmm. That's it. Compare yeah. that against um, Senator Paul's, Senator Rand Paul's legislation, uh, what, he, what we call the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act. That's Senate Bill 3955. I challenge people to go look it up. He mm -hmm. wrote that six months ago, about eight months ago. Um, after yeah. the uh, after the incident with Brianna Taylor, and his bill's one page long, um, and it would ban no knock raids at the federal and state level. Period. End mm -hmm. of story. Sign it today, tomorrow. No more no knock raids in any state or uh, from any state uh, from the state or from you know the federal government. Period. End of story. No studies. No maybe reparations. No hopeful national apology. Bam. It's done. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that I look for and support. Sorry, I'm going on a tirade. No, you're absolutely right. You know, direct, what is the actionable item that we're going to be seeking? Right. You know, government should be, you know, obviously you and I both support limited small government at best. Um, <clears throat> what this is, is just another way to spend money mm -hmm. without uh, any tangible um, positive effects. Yeah. Other, I mean, now, now they might use something that they studied off of this probably to facilitate another commission because they'll, they'll get an action item off of this and they'll right. be like okay let's study this let's spend more money on this like right like it, it's just you know it, it's an expenditure of money and what i think yeah. that people may not realize is that one we're going to first start by spending 12 million dollars of everyone's money so mm -hmm. if you're a taxpayer doesn't matter whether you're white or black or some other uh, ethnicity, race, or of or, or origin. It doesn't matter. 
you are here in this country, part of that $12 million comes from your tax money and you're not even getting anything out of it. No guarantee, at least. Um, the only guarantee is that, hey, we're going to put together a group of people to study this thing and tell us many of the things that are not really contested. You know, there are some things that may that might be contested. You know, um, I think the only thing that I saw that was that might be contested in the bill is that it asserts there's an overwhelming amount of documentation that proves the effects of slavery linger today. Uh, and there's there's a great debate about that. That's not something that we need to have here. Um, not particularly, not, you know, maybe we'll do that something about that in the future. But there's a great there's a great debate on that from, you know, from regular everyday people all the way up to intellectuals on whether or not um, we can really look at slavery today is having um, such an impact that it impedes people from being successful and ha living fulfilled lives. Right. Mm. That doesn't mean I mean, you know, effects will probably always be there in some way or another. Right. There are races today and that probably came uh, is rooted in a long line of. Uh, you know, of events that occurred, or, you know, over this nation's history. Uh, but the question really is, is, are those effects enough to keep you from, uh, from being successful and living a fulfilled life? And when people, before somebody answers that, they need to think and say, okay, well, uh, people like Bessie Coleman, people like, uh, you know, uh, Marshall Bass and some others, you know, who back in the early 20s and even earlier had accomplished great things despite the barriers that they faced right are your are the are, are are you know i guess the argument would be are the barriers they faced then more or less than they are today hmm. um and i don't disagree that there are barriers but i think the barriers are tremendously less today and it is a lot easier for any person in this country to become successful than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? That, that, that should be uncontestable, to be honest right. with you. That, that's, um, you know, and it's not to say that we don't have work. We do. We just, uh, I acknowledged it earlier. Race relations, conversations about them, we got a lot of work to do on that, you know, uh, but it's on both sides. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where I land on this issue is that saying, hey, look, in as much as true white people may be acting in ways that show some fragility toward the conversation. Um, uh, people that are accusing them of these things, they also have a role in that conversation. Yeah. Um, but to get back to this bill review, you know, the idea of a bill review is just to look at it and say, all right, what are we getting and is that what we want? You know, do we want Congress spending their time, our money on this to give us whatever it is that's promised in this bill? And this bill just simply doesn't promise a whole lot. That's that's no. that's my big issue. And you've got 173 people that have signed on 100, 173 uh, members of Congress have signed on as co-sponsors of this bill, the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act, which, again, immediately sign it today. Tomorrow it has its impact immediately. Um, that has two people that have signed on as a co-signer. All three people that are on that bill are Republicans, not a single Democrat. What does that say? You know, I don't want to get into it and say that's telling us, you know, a huge amount. But, um, you know, I will say that uh, it tells us a little bit. It, it kind of says, you know, or at least at least poses the question, are they really being honest when they sign one bill and just ignore another bill? Are they really being honest about uh, about about resolving issues within the black community, resolving issues that the black community faces? I'm not so convinced. You know, and, and just just to clarify, too, I don't think that says anything good about Republicans either, because what it does is those two two individuals. Right. Did that. Right. It tells me something about them. Right. There's um, only two. There's only two. And, and th those that's not a party move. What the Democrats are doing is a party move. Right. Much. You know, the RNC does not support um Justice for Breonna Taylor. So I just want to be clear. That's, that's right. Rand right. Paul. Absolutely. That, that's yeah. his libertarianism screaming out of him. Right. Um, right. The very little bit he that decides, he got. Right. The, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, so I, I just I want the viewers to make sure that that's not a, a GOP plug. Oh, yeah. No, no. I was just comparing and contrasting, you know, this other bill, which has a very, very identifiable outcome, a very, very measurable outcome. We can measure it because it says ban no-knock raids. Well, you sign it, and the next day, if there's a no-knock raid, we know that somebody was, uh, that, that, that either one of two things happened. 
either the bill was incomplete and it didn't cover something and they got away with it or somebody ignored the bill, right? Yeah. Um, and we can see whether or not the bill has an effect because in six months we can say, all right, how many no-knock raids have we, uh, have we had? Okay, zero. Let's assume for a moment it was zero. Okay, great. What does society look like now, now that we don't have no-knock raids? Are there fewer people that are dead from police interactions? You know, so it's very, very verifiable where you don't have that, you know, the, the, the measurement available to you um, in this particular bill, H.R. 40. And right. so for that, I have to give it a big thumbs down. I am not I'm opposed to this bill. It doesn't produce anything that I think is uh, measurable. And um, I don't think anybody else should either. Uh, right with you. Right. I need to get one of those big uh, thumbs so I can right. on these this segment, I can I can put it up or down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, uh, it's it's yeah. I, I I reject. I gotcha. All right. Well, I think that comes to the end of our show. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope you will start reading some bills, and I hope you will consider the uh, the arguments that we posed here about this book, White Fragility, and whether or not it's an idea that should be advanced forward. And if you are watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below and to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air. I want you to head on over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media. And that is where the weekly episode of me airs on Monday night at 10 p.m. Or you can join Josh Fields here with me today from the Libertarian Apothecary as we discuss on Friday night at 11 p.m. the topic from Monday. So we do a, we do a dual type show here. We've got the monologue for people that like, you know, the short and sweet. And then we've got the little bit longer dialogue style, discussion style that Josh and I do. And that's at 11 p.m. on Friday nights, or you can wait for it to come out on YouTube. But actually, I would, you know, really like it if you just run over there to, again, that's trobo.live forward slash free speech media. And you know what? While you're there, go ahead and check out some of the other free speech media network shows, because I think you're going to like them. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and we are out. <laughs>